just a couple announcements. Um, you you might have received this when you, you came in. It's a fear not. And these are scriptures for like, do not be afraid, fear not. Our, our study tonight is laying aside busyness and anxiety. And we had done a luncheon a few years back where we gave these out kind of, I think we laminated them. Um, and it's true that there's 365 <laughs> verses on don't be afraid, fear not, you know, throughout the Bible, um, like one for each day. I was just like, it's just so neat. But anyway, so in here you'll see verses. And what's nice is if you're running into fear or anxiety, you can take this and write the verses out. And, and I'll share with you how that helped me in my time of really severe anxiety. So that's that. And then um, the April study date will most likely be uh, changed. So just keep your eyes open. I know it says April 1st on our sheets, but as we announce it, um, you know, we're, we've got to make sure we can get the room to change, you know, to change the date. So, but keep that in mind as we move forward. And um, I think that is all, like, the announcements. But as we have been, we've been standing together and reading a psalm because um, we, uh, Angela, um, she's, she's a vocalist, but she doesn't have an instrument, so... Um, I feel like to stand up and read the psalm to worship the Lord is impacting. It's impacting to me. So can we please stand and turn to Psalm 93, and then I will read um, the odd number of verses, and you will read the even. It's a short psalm, but it's beautiful. As I was praying over, over these, you know, I just I wanted something that really declared the character of God. And I love this psalm. So Psalm 23, and it says, starts off. I'm, I'm sorry, 93. <laughs> 93, I'm sorry. Um, the Lord reigns. He is clothed with majesty. The Lord is clothed. He has girded himself with strength. Surely the world is established so that it cannot be moved. The floods have lifted up, O Lord. The floods have lifted up their voice. The floods lift up their waves. The Lord of the high is mightier than the noise of many waters, than the mighty waves of the sea. Your testimonies are very sure. Holiness adorns your house, O Lord, forever. Amen. Father God, we thank you that you are mightier than anything that we consider strong, that you are a God that we could run to and be safe, that we could go before you, Lord, and just have peace that surpasses all understanding. How we love your word, O oh Lord. Thank you for Psalm 93. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, tonight's study to me is probably going to be really practical, you know. Um, it's laying aside or putting off busyness and anxiety. When busyness and anxiety run amok in our lives, they will deplete us not only of rest, but they will deplete us of peace. Busyness is a major problem in so many of our lives. I, you know, it's just the society in which we live. We are um, so technically knowledgeable that I feel like it makes us go in a faster pace, a busier pace, having to do more, or we do more than like we would normally do. So um, it's, it's, a ma it's a major problem. Busyness, again, robs us of peace and joy and rest, and most importantly, it robs us from the time spent gazing upon the Lord and being in his word. Reasons why we find ourselves busy, well, we touched on this last time we talked about being a people pleaser. A lot of times it's hard to say no, but you need to ask the Lord, oh Lord, what do you want me to do and what don't you want me to do? It's very important that we seek him out for that. 
because there's so many things that we can do and there's so much we want to do but if we become busy we are uh, um, unable to spend that time with the Lord. We desire sometimes approval by others and therefore allow ourselves to become involved in things that we should not be involved in. And I talked about that last time, choosing, um, instead of choosing what's good, choosing what's best, you know. We are, um, at times, when we find ourselves busy, we are avoiding God sometimes. Sometimes we almost we don't realize it but it's like we have we're it's kind of an avoidance where you're not spending time just having your heart open before him sometimes i mean that could you know being honest before the lord coming face to face with him and um we find ourselves busy sometimes with just our everyday responsibilities we are women and we don't you know some of us work full-time um, some of us who you know don't work full-time we still have our households and meals to cook and family to take care of and and so um, these things will keep us so busy though that we are lacking our time with Jesus the effects of busyness what what affects busyness well it scatters your thoughts and it'll keep you unfocused. It causes clutter and disorganization, not only in your home, but it causes clutter and disorganization with the Lord. It can affect the way you relate to people. Your answers, answers can become curt and to the point. And I find myself doing that when I'm super busy and I'm running around and someone asks me a question and I just, I, I answer it and I'm moving on, you know. And, and the Lord wants us to just take a step back. Busyness will affect us even in the way we relate to others. Um, it also keeps us from connecting with people. It'll keep us from really sitting and just connecting with either our husbands, our children, our friends. Um, it, we need to, um, these are just the effects of busyness. It keeps us from um, our time with those that are most important in our life, which is the Lord, number one, and then family. Oswald Chambers says this, the main thing about Christianity is not the work we do but the relationship we maintain and the atmosphere produced by that relationship. That is all God asks us to look after, and it is the one thing that is being continually assailed. The enemy knows that if he could keep us busy with silly things almost, it'll keep us from God. There's just one thing that the Lord wants us to look after, to care for, to remain in. And that one thing is our love and our relationship with him. In order to obtain rest in the busyness of our lives, we must be filled up with him. The rest I'm referring to here is not physical rest, although when we get busy, we need that. It's important. But it's that inner rest. It's that inner calm. When we become very, very busy, we're not tending to that. And we can become very, very um, restless. And we don't even know why, you know? It's because we're lacking that time with the Lord. Paul prayed an amazingly wise prayer for the saints in Colossae. And we can apply this to our lives. And when we do, it's, it, it produces a very sweet peace within our souls and um, if you could turn there it's Colossians 1 9 through 12 Colossians 1 9 for this reason we also since the day we heard it do not cease to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might, according to his glorious power for all patience and long suffering with joy and giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance. You know, ladies, if we take this, 
and we make it our prayer for ourselves and for those that we love. We are going to just have the peace of God, that peace that surpasses all understanding, that other people look at us and say, in the midst of all this, you have peace. Um, this is an amazing prayer. The knowledge of his will here in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Um, this, we want to walk worthy, fully pleasing him. And we just need to go before him. We need to spend time with him and refuse to become too busy. We need to ask God to strengthen us with all might in his power Give us his patience and his long suffering, and then spend time thanking him. It's been said, don't be unwise enough to think that we are serving God best by constant activity at the cost of headache and broken rest. I am getting to be of the opinion that we may be doing too much. We want at least, this is my own want, a higher quality of work. Our labor should be to maintain unbroken communion with our blessed Lord. Then we shall have entire rest and God abiding in us. That which, which we do will not be ours, but will be his. We can sometimes get so caught up doing ministry that we forget the one in whom we're serving. You know, we serve, 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 serve but we're letting our time with him falls short. So my question is, are you maintaining unbroken communion with the Lord? That's a daily communion with him, a time in his presence, in his word, in prayer, just praising him and proclaiming his character to him. Um, and are you maintaining that? If not, you need to lay aside the busyness. You need to put it off and be, come in the presence of the Lord. Jesus himself took time to be set apart from ministry and busyness, to be alone with his Father. In fact, all the more you and I need to withdraw to a quiet place and rest a while before God. I thought it interesting that I think I brought this out in our luncheon, and I'm bringing it out again. Um, Luke 5, 15 and 16 says, However, the report went around concerning the Lord, him, all the more, and great multitudes came together to hear and to be healed by him of their infir infirmities. And what did he do when all the multitudes were around him? So he himself often withdrew into the wilderness and prayed. Unless we withdraw from the busyness, and come into his presence, we're going to be caught up in it, ladies, and we're not going to reflect him. We're not going to reflect him in the way we interact with people. We're not going to reflect him in any way, shape, or form because we, are, we have unbroken communion. Matthew 14, 13 says, When Jesus heard it, he departed from there by boat to a deserted place by himself. But when the multitudes heard, they followed him on foot from the cities. You know, a couple things about withdrawing that I would like to point out is that this doesn't mean that, again, you stop doing the work of the ministry. I've had women come to me at times, and they've become so very busy. They've wanted to step away from ministry. And sometimes God is calling you to do that. But a lot of times, God just wants you to get that right. He doesn't necessarily want to pull you out of ministry. He just wants you to be in communion with him so you can do the ministry in a more effective way for him and for his glory. It means that we should continue to serve him in the ministry in wisdom, wisdom by setting time aside, laying aside some of the busyness to be alone with him. It doesn't mean for you and I to schedule a trip to the ocean and leave everybody because we need to get away from it all. That would be nice. We, you know, but that does, that's not what this means. So many times people will say, if I can only get out of town, if I can only just get away, then I'll rest and spend time with the Lord. But we need to do that here in the place which he has placed us. 
yes, getting away is wonderful. And Jesus did that. He went to the deserted place to rest a while. And sometimes he's calling us to do that. But we need to, in the everyday, put aside the busyness. Matthew 11. Oh, I want to say, a sure sign that you have allowed your busyness to rob you of your much-needed time with the Lord is that your labors will begin to feel very burdensome. They weigh you down, and you may begin to find yourself murmuring and complaining about what you have to do. When you find yourself doing that, you, that's an indicator that says you need to be alone with the Lord and get that right. Ecclesiastes says, better a handful with quietness than both hands full together with toil and grasping for the wind. Matthew eleven twenty eight thirty 30 says, Jesus says, come to me, all you in, who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lonely in heart, and you'll find rest for your souls. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. I love that. His yoke is easy. His burden is light. It doesn't weigh us down. Isaiah 30, verses 15 and 16 says, For thus is the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, in returning... And rest you shall be saved. In quietness and confidence shall be your strength. And it goes on to say, but you would not. You would not what? Return from the unbroken communion that you might find yourself in tonight. He wants us to have continual communion with him. One of the best accounts given in scripture of rest and of busyness is giving to, given to us in Luke chapter 10, verses 38 through 42, and that is Mary and Martha. It is a story of the two sisters serving the Lord in different ways. So it's the account of them. So let's turn there. Let's go to Luke chapter 10, and we're going to start um, at verse 38. I tell you, I understand why the men like it a little cooler in here because I don't know are you guys hot tonight yes. what is with this this was at the lunch and it is like really really warm so I don't can does anyone know how to work that I I I don't just the one on the side there Angela the other there? oh yeah it is that yeah what's it on Oh my goodness, no wonder. I'm thinking to myself, no wonder they like it cool. It's like right here, there's like a heat blowing down. I don't know. That's interesting. Wasn't it like that at the luncheon too? Yeah. What's that about? <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Angie, for doing that. Okay, so let's get back to Luke chapter 10 with the account of Mary and Martha. Now it happened as they went that he entered, I'm sorry, and now, is, and now it happened as they went that he entered a certain village and a certain woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. She had a sister called Mary who also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was distracted with much serving. And she approached him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Therefore, tell her to help me. And Jesus answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and troubled about many things. But one thing is needful. And Mary has chosen that good part. Which, which shall not be taken away from her. This is such a rich portion of scripture for us. Notice that the scripture says that Mary, who also, this who also implies that Martha was also a woman who found her place at the feet of Jesus as well. I love that word also because it shows that Martha, yes, she was busy serving, but she also spent time at the feet of her Savior. In this portion of scripture, Martha is distracted 
with much serving, and she was worried and troubled about many things. And I don't know about you, but when I have company or I'm serving, even in, it, within the church, I want it all to be so nice and perfect for everyone, and I want everyone blessed. And can you imagine? This is the Lord in her home. I know I'd be in a frenzy. I know it. I know I'd be in a frenzy. And so she was tr worried and troubled because she allowed herself to become distracted from, it says, much serving, the busyness in her life. And she was neglecting the most important thing. And, the, and she needed to do only one thing, and that was to sit at her Savior's feet to hear his word. So my question to you, are you distracted with much serving? Are you worried and troubled about many things? It says here in this scripture, Jesus was so sweet in what he told Martha. He said, you need to just do one thing, and that's what she is doing, Mary. That one thing is to sit at my feet and to hear my word. You know, God will speak to us in our hearts, right? I mean, he has spoken to me. I'm sure he has spoken to you. But when you sit before God, you need to bring your word. This is where he speaks. And if he is speaking something to your heart, it has to align up with the, the word of God, right? I mean, if it doesn't align up with the word of God, then it's probably not him. It's probably you. And, and that's okay. I always say that to people. I think, you know, I feel, like, I feel like the Lord wants me to share something with you. I feel like he might have spoken to me. And if you don't bear witness to this, it's because he didn't. <laughs> you know, I mean, it, it, might, it might just be my heart. But, but you know, but it has to align up with the word. It is the place at our Savior's feet that we find hope and courage and peace and calm, and rest, and truth in our souls. So ladies, put a stop to the busyness in your life. You might need to just start with one thing that you're going to have to go before God, lay it all out, and say, Lord, is there anything I need to give to you? What is it, Lord, that is keeping me distracted from my time with you? Spurgeon said this, what I can do for Christ is little. What he did for me is so amazing, so matchless, so unspeakable, so glorious, that I ought to give that major part of my attention. I may sometimes run with Martha to do what Christ needs of me, but I think I should, be more, should more frequently sit with Mary to receive from Christ what I need from him. So lay aside the busyness, put it aside, throw it off, go before him, lay your life out, your daily schedule. You know, I think it was Luther who said, I'm so busy today that I must spend at least, I know, like four hours in prayer. You know, and I have found that when I get up, even if it's 10 or 15 minutes earlier and I lay my heart before the Lord, my whole day goes better. It's smoother. Um, I'm more in tune with him and what he wants me to say. And I'm able to, like, like um, just sort out what I don't need to do for that day. Lay your busyness before him. If you are busy, you're being robbed. You're being distracted of your time with him. Well, the next portion is laying aside our anxiety. And I don't know... I, if there's anyone here who's never had anxiety, I'd love to talk with you because I, I, I don't know. I feel like everyone at some point in time in their life deals with it. And um, it is, it actually stifles you. There, you can't even control it in the Lord. And can I just throw this out to you that just because you're a woman who has walked with the Lord for years, it doesn't mean you're less of a mature Christian 
or a mature woman in the Lord because you experience anxiety or anxiety attacks. We, there's been talk and we've shared, I was sharing like yesterday about, it's true that worry can be a sin. I believe that it can be because we're not trusting in our God. I remember Kay Arthur saying when we were doing her study on the names of, of God, it was an amazing study. At the time, she was really spot on. It was years ago. And I remember her saying that everything in our life is filtered through his fingers of love no matter what that might be. Everything is filtered through his fingers of love. And so sometimes we find ourselves worrying, and it can border on sin. But anxiety is a little different. Anxiety actually is a product of worry, and sometimes it's uncontrollable. It could even be because you you have a medical issue with your thyroid or, you know, there are med medical issues for anxiety. Sometimes you can't even control it. But the good news is that God is here and he's with you. And, and he will get you through the anxiety that you might have tonight or you might experience in the future. He will get you through. Why do I say that? Because he is faithful and because I stand as a testimony of that. So when I was about 28 years old, I had experienced a lot of fear and a lot of anxiety. It just started at that age. And um, I was a Christian, and I had been walking with the Lord for maybe eight years or so. The anxiety attacks were so bad, I would have multiple ones all day long. It wasn't like I just had one or two here and there. I would have multiple ones all day long. I'd wake up, open my eyes, not even thinking about anything, and I was experiencing an anxiety attack as I laid in bed. So anxiety is a funny thing. And the thing about it is that God can get you through it and take it in his time from you. So if you're sitting there feeling like you're hopeless, or you know, you're know you less of a Christian woman, that's the enemy. That's Satan at his core, trying to get you out of the race. Did you know that most fears are not even valid? You know, we become anxious over something that isn't even real sometimes. It's not even tangible. It's the what if, right? It's, but what if? It's those questions that give us anxiety. Anxiety will never solve the problem, but it'll only, it, it will never make it go away. But the only thing anxiety does, it keeps your focus on you and not on God. And I can say that boldly, and I, I'm sorry, I don't want you to feel hurt by that, but it's true. When you have anxiety, the focus is truly on you. And I know because that's, it was on me <laughs> when I had it. And you know, even though like it was 28, it was 30 years ago, I'm 58 years old, there are things sometimes that will just, I don't even know what it is just spur on an anxiety attack. And I'm like, why am I I'm not even thinking of anything? But, but it's something will spur it on. An anxious person is distressed, disturbed, worried, troubled, concerned, uneasy, ill at ease, disquieted, restless, and nervous. Being anxious is going to deplete us of hope and peace and trust in the Lord. It causes us to be, again, focused on ourselves. When we, and when we are focused on ourselves, we cannot function properly in any area of our lives. Webster defines anxiety as this, painful or apprehensive uneasiness of mind, usually over an impending or an, or an anticipated ill. And that makes a lot of sense. It's like it's not even something that's real. We just, we anticipate it, or we're afraid of it, or we're scared of it. it. Anxiety is a fearful concern or interest, an abnormal and overwhelming sense of apprehension, and fear often marked by um, physiological signs such as sweating, tension, increased pulse. If you've ever had an anxiety attack, that's what happens. 
and Webster's defining this. <laughs> and it's caused by doubt concerning the reality and nature of the threat and by self-doubt about one's capacity to cope with it. Do you struggle with fear? Fear is the primary source of anxiety. In fact, they're partners in crime, I call them. <laughs> you know, they're, they're partners in crime because in order to snuff out fear, we need to focus on the greatness of God and develop a fear not scripture journal. And that's why I handed those out again tonight. We had them, like I said, a few years back. But something that really helped me when I was going through that. Now, when I say helped me, it didn't take my anxiety attacks away. It didn't take my fears away. My fear not journal didn't really do that. What it did was it continually poured into me the character of God. And once I was pouring in the character of God, I began to realize, like our Psalm 93, He's mightier than even the waters and the waves of the sea. He's mighty. Why should I be afraid? Why should I be concerned? He's got it. He's got it under control. He's God. Isaiah 41.10 was a scripture that was given to me through my pastor's wife. I was um, in California, and I was with Phil, and I was you know, young at that time, I was 28, I was experiencing all this fear and anxiety. And Kay's study was in the morning, and I decided I was going to go to her study. I was so excited because I'd never really met her face to face. I'd talked to her over the phone, I'd heard her speak, but I never face to face. I sit down, and what does she do? And the power of the Holy Spirit and the anointing of God begins to expound on Isaiah 41.10. And that is in the Amplified, fear not, there is nothing to fear, for I am with you. Do not look around you in terror and be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and harden you to difficulties. Yes, I will help you, yes. I will uphold you and retain you with my victorious right hand of rightness and justice. Isaiah 35, 3 and 4, strengthen the weak hands and make firm the feeble and tottering knees. Do you feel that way when you're having, I, when I had an anxiety attack, my heart would pump real fast that you, you could actually see it pumping through my blouse, you know, and so, and then I would begin to get weak. My legs would get weak and my breathing and all that. And I love this verse. Strengthen the weak hands, make firm the feeble and tottering knees. Say to those who are feel, fearful and hasty heart, be strong. Fear not. Behold, your God will come with a vengeance. With recompense of God, he will come and he will save you. You're going to get through this anxiety. It's not going to always be be in your life to the extent that it may be now because God is faithful and he is strong if you're experiencing major anxiety and anxiety attacks I always share with women please seek medical confirmation that you're good because what happened with me was my heart would begin to pump and race so bad that I, I, I needed to make sure it wasn't like a heart condition, you know? Um, or my hands were going numb. My legs were getting weak. And I thought, is it something going on in my body? So you want to you wanna seek out a medical confirmation that all that it is is anxiety. And when you find yourself in the midst of your anxiety attack, don't fight it physically don't fight it because when you do it gets worse it it magnifies and I experienced that so what I would do when I would get these anxiety attacks like on and off all day long <laughs> I would get my fear knots my scriptures and I would try to remain calm even though my anxiety attack was going on and I would read these fear knot scriptures 
And I mean, not all the time did they, they go away, but again, it strengthened me in my inner soul. It strengthened me. I came to a point where I realized that it didn't matter if I was having anxiety because God was bigger than that. When your thoughts of fears raise their ugly heads, I always say there's four very simple, practical things you can do. The first is, ref they're all with an R. So the first one is refuse to think about it. Refuse to, to, to let that be a thought. Stop and bring that thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Second Corinthians 10.5 says, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. So the first thing is when you're anxious and you're fearful, refuse to allow that to keep running through your mind. Just refuse. With God's help, bless you, with God's help, because he will give you that, you know. I mean, in our of ourselves, we can't really do much. You know, right? I mean, as we, we need God. But these are simple steps. So refuse right away. Okay, this thought, the scary thought has come to my mind right now. Well, I'm not, I, Lord, I'm going to give that thought to you. Under your, I'm giving it captive to you. So that's the first thing, refuse. Then remember. Remember his word. Remember his promises to you. You know, whenever I'm going through a trial or a suffering, I seek out the word. And he will give me promises that I could cling to and hold on to in that time. Psalm 94, 19 says, In the multitude of my anxieties within me, your comforts delighted my soul. Those comforts are the word of God. They're the testimonies. They're the word of God. So refuse to think about it. Bring it captive to Christ. Remember his word. Get those promises out. If it's a fear not journal or whatever promise. And then once you have that promise, replace the thought with scripture. When that thought comes through your mind every two minutes, <laughs> right? That's what happens when you're anxious or you're fearful. It'll keep, it doesn't stop. When that thought does that, replace it every time with scripture. I walked around the house putting scriptures everywhere, by my kitchen sink, on my bathroom mirror, on the refrigerator, um, in the laundry room. And every time I began to get anxious, I would begin to just proclaim the promises of God. In Isaiah 41, 10, sometimes I would say it all day. Fear not, I'm with you. Thank you, Lord. You know, I'm your God. I will strengthen you. Oh, thank you, Lord. <laughs> you know, but I would repeat that to my heart, you know, um, not like a mantra. I'm not saying we're going to do any mantra things, but you're going to take the promises that God gave you and cling to them. So you refuse to think about it, give it captive. You remember his word, pull those promises. Then you replace those thoughts with those promises, with scripture. You're going to replace the fearful thoughts with scripture. And then you're going to refresh with prayer. Those are four simple steps that are practical that will truly help you. And it may not be like in that moment, like I said, that anxiety attack is going to go away in the moment. But I am telling you, you continue to be filled with the Lord and his word. You will come to a point where you will trust him. And whether you're having a severe anxiety attack, you know that God is with you and you can trust him. 1 Peter 5, 6 and 8 in the Amplified reads, Therefore humble yourselves or demote, lower yourselves in your own estimation under the mighty hand of God, that in due time he will exalt you, casting the whole of your care. I love that in the Greek, casting the whole of your care, it goes on to say all your anxieties, all your worries, all your concerns, once and for all 
on him. Is that amazing? We need to lay aside, throw it down at the foot of the cross. It goes on to say, for he cares for you affectionately and cares about you watchfully. He, does, he never takes his eyes off of you. His love for you is so majestic and kind. And, and he cares about you watchfully. And I don't know about you, but that really does diminish my fears when I think on these things. Again, you might want to write this out in the Amplified. You might want to rem like memorize it in the Amplified. So when you're anxious, you can recall the scripture. And it says, be well balanced, temperate, sober of mind, be vi vigilant and cautious at all times. For that enemy of yours, Satan, the devil, roams around like a lion roaring in fierce hunger, seeking someone to seize upon and devour. And the enemy knows your weakness of fear and anxiety, and he is going to prey on that weakness. Just remember that he may roar, but he has no teeth in his mouth. God is stronger than him, and you must rely on that. If you are fearful or anxious, this scripture in 1 Peter gives wonderful insight on what you and I need to do. Well, first we want to humble ourselves. Oh yes, we're going to cast our cares upon him. Why? Well, he cares for us. And the word cast is defined as, again, to throw off. We can throw off our cares, our anxieties, our concerns, those things that fill us with worry unto Jesus. And we are to be aware and alert. So we're to, we're to humble ourselves, we are to cast our cares, and then we're to be aware and alert that the enemy is attacking. He's attacking you with anxiety. That's, it's an, a ploy of the enemy. Psalm 55, 22 says, Cast your burden on the Lord, and he shall sustain you. He shall never permit the righteous to be moved. I love that. We are righteous because we stand in him. It's that positional righteousness. So he's not going to let you, if you are his child, to be moved, whether you feel like you're being moved like crazy with anxiety because that's what anxiety does it kind of gets you stirred up and ang more anxious anxiety just keeps piling but cast your burden on the lord lay that burden at the foot of the cross and he will sustain you and it says he'll never permit the righteous to be moved another thing that can cause anxiety is, and you ha we all have to be very careful of this, is when we harbor sin in our hearts, when there's something that we just aren't letting go of that isn't pleasing to the Lord, we can become bitter and angry and anxious. Anxiety. I think it's interesting that the following familiar scripture about anxiety includes a searching of sin. And that's why I'm bringing it out. It is Psalm 139. We know it well. Verses 23 and 24. It says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties. And see if there is any wicked way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. I don't believe it's a coincidence that the Holy Spirit put those two together in those verses. So we do have to do a heart check. We have to do a heart check at all times. When we keep our minds on Jesus and his truths, we are able to have the peace that surpasses all understanding rather than the anxiety that strangles. Spurgeon said this, when we muse upon eternal love, immutable purposes, covenant promises, the finished redemption, the risen Savior, his union with his people, the coming glory, and such like things, we can't help to have our heart leap within us and have peace. I have shared this with many of you, but I think some of you 
I've never, you've never heard this, but my pastor's wife, Kay Smith, talked to us all the time about the alphabet of praise. And you know what? This alphabet of praise, I tell you, it's just simple, those simple four steps. I cannot tell you how God uses it to calm you in the midst of your fears and anxieties. I w when I was, in, I was in the hospital years ago with a breast biopsy that they thought was not going to be good. And I remember that as I was waiting in this machine thing that they had me on, it was like a brand new thing they were doing. And um, I was laying there and I began <laughs> to get the worst anxiety attack. Like my heart was palpitating and I just had a full blown anxiety attack. And the Lord just put on my heart, alphabet of praise. And basically, as in a sample, I just I wrote it down, but I always say different ones. I say this pretty much all the time with the Lord. But it's like, A, he's absolutely awesome. B, he's beautiful to behold. C, he is a caring Christ. D, his div he's, he has divine deity. E, he's excellent in everything. F, he's forever faithful. G, he is great in goodness. H, holy, holy, holy. We read in Psalm 93 tonight that his, the holiness of, adorns him, right? I, he's impeccably infinite. J, he is a just judge. And you get it, right? But in, when I first started it, I, I just did one, like, description of him you know and then I'm like okay now I want to do kind of two <laughs> you know? and and three you know and and when you are focused on this on the Lord you can't help to have your fears diminish so that's another practical thing you can do um, is the alphabet of praise and when we focus on the greatness of God it relieves us of our anxieties now, most of you know Philippians 4, 6, and 7. I know that it's one of those scriptures everyone probably knows, but I want you to turn to it. This is an amazing conditional promise, and we all know that conditional promises in the word. It basically says, if you do this, I promise you this. You know, it's a conditional promise, and I love this. This is one of my favorite. This is one that I took hold of when I was going through those multiple anxiety attacks. I, I mean, I think, when I say I was having 15 or 20 today, a day, I, it's not an exaggeration. Like, it wasn't good. And I loved that I could look back on that time. And do you know what happened to me during that time, you guys? I became a woman who just focused on the character of God, and I began to learn more and more of his character, and I wouldn't take it back. I would not take that time in my life, and it got to the point where not only did the anxiety do that, but my fears kept me inside. I know there's a clinical name for that, but I wouldn't even go out. And poor Pastor Phil, he was, just, he was so kind and gracious during that time, but it got really bad. But I would not take it back because I learned about my God. I learned about his character. But Philippians 4, 6, and 7, I'm going to read again in the Amplified. You could read along in your, your like New King James or what version you have, but it says, Do not fret, worry, or have any anxiety about anything. But in every circumstance and in everything by prayer and petition, definite requests, with thanksgiving, continue to make your wants known to God. All right, that's, that's the thing that we're exhorted to do. And then I love verse 7. And when you do this, God's peace shall be yours, the tranquil state of a soul assured of its salvation through Christ, and so fearing nothing from God and being content with its earthly lot of whatever sort that is, that peace which transcends all understanding shall garrison and mount guard over your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. I love that. 
the Holy Spirit says your heart and your mind because it affects your mind affects your heart your soul how you're physically feeling it affects your anxieties the Greek word translated for worried or anxious here careful in Philippians 4 6 means to be pulled in different directions that's what anxiety does it pulls you in different directions and our hopes pull us in one direction our fears pull us in the opposite direction and we find ourselves feeling pulled apart <clears throat> anxiety does just that it pulls us in different directions the old English root word from which we get the word worry means to strangle worry strangles us it strangles our our impact for the Lord it strangles our time with the Lord it strangles our interactions with people worry strangles and if you've ever really worried you know how it does strangle in fact, worry has definite physical consequences. I know we talked about different things last time, but you know, you can it's this is like medical. Physical consequences of worry, headaches, neck pains, ulcers, back even back pains. Worry affects our thinking, our digestion, and even our coordination. It's it does impact us. And from the spiritual point of view, worry is wrong thinking think about that worry is really wrong thinking and wrong feeling so it's wrong thinking of the mind wrong feeling of the heart about the circumstances the people and the things around us worry is the greatest thief of joy it is not enough for us however to tell ourselves to quit worrying you need to know that because that will never capture this thief worry is an inside job and it takes more than good intentions to get victory. The antidote to worry is a secure mind and being secured by the peace of God that keeps garrison and guard like a soldier over your heart and mind through Christ Jesus. In other words, when you have a secure mind, the peace of God will guard you and the God of peace will guide you when you have a secure mind. I think that it's interesting that Paul does not write, just pray about it. He doesn't say that, just, just pray about it. He's too wise to do that. He uses three different words to describe the right praying. Prayer, supplication, and thanksgiving. Right praying involves all three. The word prayer is the general word for making requests known to, to the Lord, and it carries the idea of adoration devotion worship it's that alphabet of praise right whenever we find ourselves worrying our first action ought to be to get alone with god and worship him and declare his good his goodness and his character to him and i've said this before not for our sake or for his sake but for our sake right he knows how mighty he is but we declare it because it, it helps us adoration is what is needed we must see the greatness and majesty of God we must realize that he is big enough to solve any problem too often we rush into his presence we hastily tell him our needs and when we ought to approach his calm, his throne calmly getting rid of that busy, busy part of our life approach him calmly with time at hand and in deep reverence so the first step we see here is right praying or adoration. The second is supplication. And this is an earnest sharing of our needs and problems. There's no place for half-hearted and sincere prayer here. You, you know, we need to just say it like it is, because the Lord knows. While we know we are not heard for our much speaking in Matthew 6, 7 and 8, Still, we recognize that our Father wants us to be earnest in our asking, Matthew 7, verses 1 through 11. And this is the way Jesus prayed in the garden, Hebrews 5, 7. And while his closest disciples were sleeping, Jesus was sweating great drops of blood. 
Supplication is not a matter of carnal energy, but of spiritual intensity. And we see that in Romans 15.30 and again in Colossians 4.12. It's that intensity of just crying out to God. Being desperate for him. So after adoration and supplication comes appreciation. He talks about this, Paul, giving thanks to God. And we see this in Ephesians 5.20, again in Colossians 3.15 through 17. And certainly the Father enjoys hearing us say thank you. You know, sometimes we can find ourselves eager to ask, but slow to appreciate, right? In anything that could be, you know, we take for granted those in our lives that are really good to us, right? We do at times. We take them for granted. And sometimes we can take God for granted for the things that he is doing in our lives. So we must thank him in everything. You know, when I was going through that, severe anxiety I got to a point and what happened too I mean I I was at a point where I was just so ill and non-functional um I got to a point where I just said you know what Lord first Thessalonians tells me that I am to thank you in everything not for everything but in everything and out of obedience not that I feel it but out of obedience, and this was my prayer to God, the sincere, honest, you know, I am going to, out of obedience, thank you for this. Not that I mean it, but because I know I need to thank you in all things. And you know what, ladies? I felt like at that point, God did something miraculous in me. I was able to get out of bed. And I was able to function, you know? And so we need to thank him. Paul counsels us to, to take everything to God in prayer. Not to worry about anything, but to pray about everything. In his admonition here, we are prone, ladies, to pray about the big things in our life and forget to pray about like the so-called little things until they grow and become big things. We got to nip those thoughts that come into the mind that want to cause us to worry and be fearful and anxious. Those little thoughts, they can grow into major things. So we need to nip those in the butts. You know, Pastor Phil just recently shared this. I, I don't know if it was last week, but um, this I love this. In praying about big and small things, in J. Vernon McGee's commentary, which is J. Vernon McGee is one of Pastor Phil's favorites, um, he included this following account about a lady who approached Dr. G. Campbell Morgan with this question. Dr. Morgan, she said, do you think we should pray about the little things in our lives? And Dr. Morgan, in his characteristically British manner, said, and I wish I can do accents, but I can't, so I won't even try. But in his British manner, he says, Madam, can you mention anything in your life that is big to God? There's nothing too big in your life that God can't handle. And there's nothing too small. So when we say that we take our big problems to God, what do we mean? Well, they are all little stuff to him. And what we call little, he wants us to bring to him too. Let me share with you an admonition by Fenelon. It seems to encompass here what Paul meant when he said, pray about everything. And I quote, tell God all that is in your heart as one unloads one's heart, its pleasures, its pains to a dear friend. Tell him your troubles that he may comfort you. Tell him your joys that he may sober them. Tell him your longings that he may purify them. Tell him your dislikes that he may help you to conquer them. Talk to him of your temptations that he may shield you from them. Show him the wounds of your heart that he may heal them. Lay bare your indifference to good, your depraved taste for evil, your instability. Tell him how self-love makes you unjust to others, how vanity tempts you to be insincere and how pride disguises you to yourself as to others. He goes on to say, 
If you thus pour out all your weaknesses, needs, troubles, there will be no lack of what to say. You will never exhaust the subject. It is continually being renewed. People who have no secrets from each other never want for subjects of conversation. They do not weigh their words, for there is nothing to be held back. Neither do they seek for something to say. They talk out of the abundance of the heart without consideration just what they think. And blessed are they who attain to such familiar, unreserved interaction with God. I know that was a lot, but I just thought it was awesome. I think it sums up everything that Paul was saying here in Philippians 4. If you worry about nothing, pray about everything, and be thankful, if these attitudes characterize your lives, then the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will garrison your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. And it has been said that this peace of God is a sense of holy repose and complacency, which floods the soul of a believer when he or she is leaning hard upon God. And sometimes we just have to lean hard upon God. Lean into him. He will never let you fall. Francis Havergrell, the hymnist who wrote um, the, a very um, famous hymn, Take These Hands and Let Them Be, you know, for you. There's another verse in a different hymn that she wrote, and I love it. It says, Stayed upon Jehovah, hearts are fully blessed, finding, as he promised, perfect peace and rest. The peace of God surpasses all human understanding. People of the world cannot understand it at all. And even Christians possessing it find a wonderful element of mystery about it. Because I have been there when, when we were with our grandchild and he passed away. I was there. And I felt the peace of God. And I thought, there is no way I can explain why I have such a peace. There was such a peace in that room. And it was something I couldn't even, I can't articulate. It was God. The peace garrisons our heart and the thought life. And what a needed garment it is in this day of neurosis and nervous breakdowns and antidepressants and mental distress. We need the peace of God, right? We need to stand guard over the two areas that create worry. The heart, which is the wrong feeling, and the mind, which is the wrong thinking. This peace will keep our hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. There are those who say that prayer changes things, and I can't argue with that. Prayer does change things, but that is not the primary purpose of prayer. Prayer changes you, and it changes me. That's the purpose of prayer, is going before God and being changed. Notice that we entered the passage in Philippians 4 in anxiety with worry, and we came out of that passage with peace, and between the two was prayer. Have the outward circumstances changed? No. The storm is still raging. The waves are still rolling. The thunder still resounding. Although the storm is not abated, something has happened in you and me. Something has happened to our human soul and our mind. And in our anxiety, we want God to change everything around us. Sometimes it's like, give us this, Lord. Don't let this happen. Open up this door. But we should be praying, oh, God, change me. Change me. Prayer is that secret power. We enter with worry, but we come out with peace. The result of right praying is the peace of God guarding your heart and mind. And this peace does not mean the absence of trials on the outside. It means a quiet confidence within, regardless of the circumstances, or the people, or the situation, or the things. If you find yourself anxious, 
begin to dwell on the greatness of God, and this will develop a deeper trust in God. That's what happened to me. I just developed, and I need to keep developing that. I have not attained. But that's what happened in my time of darkness, is that I began to trust him more because I began to fall back on his character. Daniel gives us a wonderful illustration of peace through prayer. When the king announced that none of his subjects were to pray to anyone except him, remember that in Daniel 6? Daniel went to his room, he opened his windows, and he prayed as never before. He prayed and he gave thanks before his God. He made supplication in that chapter, and I'm, I'm not going to, I was going to read it, but, you know, for sake of time, read Daniel chapter 6. And he made supplication in Daniel chapter 6. Prayer, supplication, and thanksgiving. All the result was perfect peace in the midst of the difficulty. Daniel was able to spend the night with the lions in perfect peace while the king in his palace couldn't even sleep. That's our mighty God. That is our mighty God. It's your mighty God. He is mighty and he is strong. So God will deliver you. He will rescue you. He will be your rest. He will be your assurance and he will be your peace in the midst of your anxieties. Ladies, we need to lay aside, place to one side. That one side is the side of the foot of the cross. That's where we need to place our anxieties. Remember that you are loved with an everlasting love. And not only that, the scripture says, but underneath are his everlasting arms. So when you are in an anxiety attack, when you are fearful, remember these scriptures. Remember them and recite them and cling to them. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you, Lord, that in the midst of our anxieties and our fears, that you are so mighty, that you are unchangeable, that, Lord, you're on the throne and nothing ever moves you. Nothing comes to a surprise to you. You are all-knowing and all-excellent and all-holy. You are filled with with everlasting love for, for these women here tonight. Lord, would you, Lord, work a healing upon them? The Lord, if they are dealing with anxiety, first of all, Lord, I pray that they not be condemned over it. Lord, bind the enemy and his roar in their lives. But Lord, may you, Lord, begin to work in them and heal them, Lord. And help all of us, Lord, to stop busying ourselves. Lord, help us to know what to say no to so that we can have sweet communion with you. We love you, Lord. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.